Father Frank Phillips has been a pastor of St. John Cantus Church for over 30 years, and he's the founder of the Canons Regular of St. John Cantus, a religious community of men dedicated to restoration of the sacred. Father Phillips received a Master of Divinity degree from St. Louis University. A member of the Congregation of the Resurrection, he was ordained a priest in January 1977. He taught music history and theory choir and religion at Weber High School for 11 years. In 1988, he was assigned as pastor to St. John Cantius Parish. He is a Knight of the Equestrian Order, the Holy Sepulchre of Jerusalem, a Knight of the Sacred Military Constantinian Order of St. George, as well as a conventual chaplain ad honorum in the Sovereign Military Order of Malta. So on behalf of the Catholic Guild, Art Guild, we're honored to host our own Frank Phillips, uh, Father Frank, Phil Frank Phillips, for his presentation, Vesture Investments. If this goes out, I'll use my teaching voice that I used to use at Weber High School. <laughs> so first of all, I'd like to uh, thank all the members of the Art Guild for inviting me to speak. Uh, vestments and vesture is something which is uh, pretty little dear to my heart because these are the sacred vestments that are used at mass, benediction, different sacraments, and so on. And so it's good if we know or be able to see what these elements are in using uh, the worship of God. So more of this is going to be like show and tell. So if I forget to use the microphone, I think I'm being recorded, so. It is important that a guild like the Catholic Art Guild exist. There are so many miserable things happening in the church today, but there are so many profoundly great and spiritual things which are developing in the whole life of the church. And that is the restoration and the recovery of the sacred. It is a guild like this with people like you interested in learning about the sacred art, but also preserving them and fostering artists to preserve the tradition of the church in her sacred worship. When I began to think about, well, what should I cover? You would not believe how many vestments and vestures there are for the clergy. I'll just list just a few. This is just a few, mind you. First of all, is there is the cassock, which you see all the priests wearing. This is a long, close-fitting, ankle-length robe worn by Catholic priests, Eastern Orthodox, Anglicans, Lutherans, and some Reformed churches. For the vestments, the symbol of authority is the stole. And this is a long, narrow strip of cloth draped around the neck, a vestment of distinction, a symbol of ordination. Deacons wear the stole across their left shoulder, diagonally across the body. Priests and bishops wear it draped across the back of the neck. And traditionally, priests crossed the stole because that is the yoke of Christ. Bishops would have the stole hanging solid, straight down, fullness of the priesthood. Then there is the alb. It's a common garment, any minister of the Eucharist. It's worn over the cassock. And the simple symbolism is that it represents baptism, the baptismal garment. For bishops, there is the pectoral cross, worn by bishops, abbots, and certain canons. Then there is a surplice, which is a shortened version of the alb. It's worn over a cassock worn by servers, choir members, and so on. There is a cope. A cope is a circular cape reaching to the ankle, used by bishops, priests, sometimes deacons. And the cope, most of the time we see that at solemn high mass 
or for like benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. For the canons in the parish here, there's what's called a rochette. It's similar to a surplus, but it has narrow sleeves and usually has cuffs that you can distinguish them. And then there's a skull cap called a zucchetto. And for the Pope, uh, the tiara. For the liturgical vestment, for the continue for the mass, there's what is known as the maniple. And this is uh, used on the left hand, and I'll show you that later. A humeral veil, a long rectangular piece of material covers the shoulders, humerus, carrying the monstrance and a solemn high mass worn by the subdeacon carrying the paten. There's a beretta, which is a rectangular shaped cap, and it is usually has a pom-pom on top. There is what is known as an amice. It is a cloth around the neck used to cover the collar of the street attire. It's worn by celebrant, deacon, subdeacon. For the subdeacon, there is what is called a tunicle. And then there's a, a dalmatic, which is worn by a deacon. For the priest, the main vestment is called the chasuble. And this is usually worn only for the celebration of the Eucharist. There's the cincture, or in some books it's called the girdle. It's long woven cord to put around the alb at the waist and actually to bring up the alb, which should be very long. For bishops, archbishops, there's a pallium. There are pontifical gloves. And I have my own personal pair here. <laughs> These you will see at Pontifical High Mass for the Tridentine Mass. And then there are Pontifical sandals called buskins. Most dangerous thing a bishop could wear <laughs> because they tie around the leg and usually slip down and many times the bishop needs assistance wearing uh, the buskins. There are so many more vestments that I could go through, but those are just a, some which you may see when you attend Holy Mass. In ancient times, practically all pagan cultures had some ritual, some service, some way of worshiping the deity of the gods. And from that, actually there were men, sometimes women, sometimes both, chosen to perform certain actions to please the gods. As time goes on, these individuals develop a certain dress based on the normal, ordinary dress of the people. But over time, these became more and more elaborate. The ceremony became more and more elaborate. And so the pagan cultures had vestments and a vesture. In the Old Testament, uh, the worship of the true God, they uh, developed uh, the rituals for worshiping God in the temple. And this, I'd like to read you some of these things. This is taken from Ecclesiasticus, or in some Bibles it's called Sirach. Now imagine entering the temple, he, the high priest, shone forth in his day as the morning star amid lowering clouds, and as the moon with its fullness of her beauty. And as the sun in his glory, so did he shine in the temple of God. And as the rainbow shedding its light in the brilliant clouds, and as the blossoming of roses in the springtime, and as the lilies on the banks near the waters, as the sweet frankincense on the summer air, as a bright fire and frankincense of flame, as a vessel of gold adorned with precious stones, as an olive tree budding forth, and a cypress tree rearing itself on high, like unto such was he when he put on the robe of glory and was clothed with the perfection of power. 
When he went up to the holy altar, he honored the vesture of holiness. So even in the Old Testament, these are inspired words. In the old law, entering the sanctuary in festal attire. Now just think of God, even in the old law, was but a weak figure of the wonderful mysteries of the new covenant. Such rich garments are proper for the liturgical functions. In the Lord's will, that his beloved spouse, the church, should appear at the altar, robed in magnificence and splendor, whenever she celebrates that holy sacrifice and spreads the table of the Lord, or even here below in this country of our exile, sees a foretaste of those joys which she is to enjoy forever in her heavenly country with the adoration of the Lamb. So like I always tell many of our men, what do we do here in this church at the altar is just a, a fraction of the beauty of the heavenly banquet which we hope to participate in. The Council of Trent declared that the use of vestments in the Holy Church rests on apostolic prescription and tradition. In the primitive ages of Christianity, the apparel for divine worship did not differ from the clothing of ordinary life, but it was distinguished from the profane clothing as rich and beautiful as possible, allowing the celebration of the divine mysteries. Now here we have, this is, we could go to the first slide. It's all black and white. These are images of what the clergy would wear in the early church. Uh, you can see the middle figure has what is called the pallium, that is the stole, and the two on either side would have something what we would know as the chasuble. This is the full chasuble, the bell chasuble. And underneath those vestments, you could see maybe the tunic, the delmatic, and so on. But also notice, the, which it should be the alb, it's white. And you see how long it is? Some of it has ornamentation that was already being permitted in the early church to distinguish it from just the tunics that were worn on the street. But you notice the length? Sometimes you'll see at the 1230 mass or even 730, the server lifting the alb as the priest descends the stairs. You see why? Yeah. <laughs> uh, most albums today are not this long, and the servers still lift the alb because it's actually still part of the rubrics. And then you see the, the chasubles, how long they are. Well, if the priest is ascending the altar or genuflecting, Sometimes you see like an insensation. Servers will hold the chasuble on either side. That's so the priest could move his arms. For the elevation of the host in the chalice at the consecration, the servers or the deacon, subdeacon, whatever, would hold the vestment. And that is not something useless, but it was practical because it made room for the priest to elevate the sacred species. Right here in front of you is a replica. Does this look familiar to the one in the middle almost? Father Brenda, you could take one side, I take the other. This is the, what is known as the Roman chasuble. The Roman chasuble covered the entire body, chasuble, castle, little house. So you can imagine all this material being carried about and elevating the host in different liturgical functions. So you needed people to assist you, deacons, servers, and so on. So the vestment itself, uh, a full vestment, 
And even in the uh, Second Vatican Council, it called for noble simplicity. This is a natural fiber. And that's why, like, the Catholic Art Guild is so important. This is a silk. So even though it's a lot of material, it's a very lightweight material. And it is a natural, natural material versus polyester, which you sweat like a horse. <laughs> but uh, the, um, this investment actually was used almost up until the late 1800s, 1900s, as the common norm for liturgical vesture. Something unfortunately happened. Uh, the church lost the ability to direct, like it does with music and art and so on, lost the ability to make these directives known and enforced. And this was left to the manufacturer and the different companies that made vestments by the dozens. These you make one at a time. You go to a catalog, you see this vestment, you buy 25 of those. And, and it came to pass that in many places the vestments destined for divine worship answered as little to the requirements of the liturgy as to those of art. Above all, and this is still a norm, the liturgical vestments should be restored to their flowing, folded, and ample form. In the New liturgical movement, there is an article or a little writing by a sister from Santa Rosa. I'd like to read this to you because it's also important in knowing what should be used in making of the sacred vestments. And here's Sister speaking. In the sacred liturgy, we worship God with our whole beings, our bodies as well as our souls. Each physical element of the holy sacrifice of the Mass has a role drawing us closer to God. This involves many things that affect our senses. Remember, as Father Joshua says, maybe our senses, we learn by our senses. <laughs> Including the choice of fabrics to be used in the liturgy. Since the beginning of the Church, the linen fabric has had a special place in the worship of God. Linen is a natural fabric made from the flax plant. Through a long process, parts of the flax stems are separated from the roots, seeds, and woody outer stems. The result is long strands of flax strick, which are spun into linen thread, then woven into fabric. Depending on the thickness of the thread and the tightness of the weaving, linen material can be of higher or lower quality. New linen is usually stiff, but over time and with wear, it becomes a beautiful, soft fabric that is used for many purposes. Now, here's what St. Augustine mentions about uh, linen. In St. Augustine, she, he explains the work of the wise woman in the Proverbs, says that flax, from which linen is made, is emblematic of our bodies, in which lives the soul. The flax is prepared by beating, then woven into linen as our flesh is purified by suffering. Moses himself details form of color for priestly vestments made only of linen formed of beaten flax to signify uh, that the perfection of the priest only comes with bearing patiently the trials in this life. And you know there's red, white, violet, green, and these mean, you know, innocence, um, red suffering, violet penance, and uh, youth, and then later black uh, sorrow. With regard to the symbolism, the following points of resemblance deserve special notice. Linen does not naturally possess its brilliant whiteness, but acquires it chiefly by being washed and bleached in the rain and the sun. Is not this the case with the whiteness and brilliancy of purity of life? Brilliantly white, that is, perfectly pure, chaste, and holy, does the soul become only by many austerities, much self-denial and mortification, and then enlightened 
by God's divine grace. I think we looked at number two. These are again further manifestations of the outer garments. And as you can see, it seems like there's no patterns and a little bit more elaborate. And also in art, I'm sure you've covered, you see the square halos? Those are people who were still living at the time, whereas the round one indicated sainthood. So the different uh, beautiful vestments, long, full, and you can see when they're holding something, the custom always was that if you're holding the sacred text or sacred vessels or anything, you have to, be ha you have, to have your hands covered. So even like at the uh, Carmel, I was always amazed how the sisters could spread out the vestments in their turnabout and putting the, vestment, uh, the vessels uh, holding a linen cloth and then putting the vessels out for the priest. I mean, when you look in there and you see, oh my gosh, what are they doing? <laughs> well, it's very mysterious, but a sense of the sacred is right up in front. So linen goes all the way back to the uh, Old Testament, but then what do we hear? Linen is the only cloth uh, associated with our Lord Jesus. After taking him down, he wrapped him in fine linen and laid him in a sepulcher that was hewed in stone, wherein not, never yet any man had been laid. And so in that tomb, we had what sometimes was called a winding cloth. There was the shroud, and it covered him. There was another cloth, a smaller one, the sudarium. I want you to remember that when I talk about the maniple. So let us be glad and rejoice and give glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath prepared herself. And it is granted to her that she should clothe herself with fine linen, glittering and white. For the fine linen are the justifications of saints. And he said to me, this is in Revelation, Blessed are they that are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb, and he saith to me, these words of God are true. Uh, remember some of the altarpieces? What was the, the monuments men? They saved the big altarpiece. And there's the adoration of the lamb. And all the elect are around, their garments washed in the blood of the lamb. End times. Now we go into the various uh, the vestments themselves, and I'll have Father Brendan me my, uh, my uh, victim. <laughs> so, now this is for the traditional Mass. And the rite of ordination of subdeacons, the bishop covers the head of the ordained with the amos, and also the manner of putting it on when according to the directions of the rubric, the amos is first placed on the head, like all the guys do, then drawn down to the neck and put over the shoulders. Here's what the bishop says. Receive the amos by which is signified moderation of speech in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Each time this is put on at mass, the priest says, Place, O Lord, the helmet of salvation upon my head, that I may be enabled to serve thee without defilement of mind or body. What does the Amos remind us of? It reminds us of the shameful veiling of the eyes of the face of Christ by the Jews, who at the same time struck him on the head and in the face, saying, Prophesy to us, O Christ, who struck thee, and uttered many other blasphemies against him. So this is put on first. This has not changed in centuries. What is the purpose? Well, you keep the neck warm, keep the vestment clean, and there was even a, some statements where it was used so that the voice would be warm enough to be able to sing at the Mass. Now, this, I don't know if that's going to keep you warm. <laughs> All it does for me is I sweat. So, <laughs> the linen strip was originally, and at the ordination still, put on over the alb. But once someone is ordained, it is 
under the alb like Father Brendan has on him now. There are certain monastic orders because they wear what is called a cowl. They have a cowl, but then they have what is called a capuche. It, it imitates, it mimics the cowl and is white and it goes over the head. The same thing as the uh, amos. But what is the helmet of salvation with which the priest at the altar should be armed against the attacks of Satan? The expression is taken from Holy Scripture, which also contains its meaning. The Apostle Paul exhorts Christians to put on the armor of God to resist the attacks of Satan. He urges to take unto them the helmet of salvation. In another place, he says Christians should be sober, having on the breastplate of faith and charity, and for the helmet, the hope of salvation. So, the protecting helmet, and consequently the amos, also which covers the head in a similar manner, are symbolic of Christian hope, hope in the goods and grace and glory acquired and promised to us by Christ is a powerful weapon of protection against, as we see in Compline so often, our adversary, the devil, who's roaring, prowling about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So the amos is a protection, a helmet against the attacks of Satan. If armies in camp should stand together against me, my heart shall not fear. If a battle should rise up against me, in this will I be confident. Such a petition is most appropriate before beginning the Holy Mass. Although the devil is ever lying in wait for a man to destroy or at least to weaken in him the life of faith and hope, Yet is it more especially at the time of the holy sacrifice that he seeks to confuse the soul by all manner of suggestions, distractions, in order to rob her of devotion and the fruits of the holy sacrifice. So the Amos now admonishes the priest to arm and to prepare himself to encounter this danger. Therefore, this great and firm confidence with which he should approach the altar is a means of attracting to himself an abundance of graces and blessings. Poor sinner that he is, he approaches the altar in faith. Now, number two, after, after the amos comes the alb. And the alb is the white garment, linen again. You have to be careful, because I got pins in there. So the alb is a common garment, and you notice the, um, what are called the apparels. These are proper to the, um, to the outer, the alb itself. I look at the next slide, I think. So here in the third one, I think that's St. Gregory the Great. Here's the Pope, he's got the tiara. He's got the vestment like this. He has his alb, see how long they are? And he's got his pontifical gloves. At the end, who's the one at the end? I can't see. Ambrose. Ah, kind of off the cuff. His stole was kind of crooked, but you know. <laughs> he's a doctor of the church, so he's, he's, he's happy. <laughs> now see, this is a little bit too short for Father Brendan. But in the Alb, uh, you have the reminiscence of the multitude of individuals wearing the white garment, washed in the blood of the Lamb at the end of time as we read in the book of the Apocalypse. The Alb is also significant for the, um, uh, our, our, our baptismal uh, promises which we are made for us. Now, when the priest puts the Alb on, the prayer that goes with us, uh, purify me, O Lord, from all stain and cleanse my heart, that washed in the blood of the Lamb, I may enjoy eternal delights. In the Middle Ages, the Amos, Alb, and Cincture were made of silk as well as richly ornamented gold and silver. By the ninth century, it became customary to put precious decorations on the edge of the Alb, right there. And 
the one that usually goes on the head. And if you wear this, can you hold this? So that would sit like that. And then when the final vestment is put on, this would be slipped down, a helmet of salvation. So all these vestments look beautiful, practical, but they also have the spiritual meaning itself. The apparels, adornments, actually kept the... Uh, Alb from being ripped apart by the priest in his arms and in his feet. The mystical meaning of all this with the, with, the, with the helmet, the arms, and the front and back are the precious wounds of Christ. So when people were watching the, um, the, or viewing the Mass, they see uh, you know, Christ crucified. The alb is a symbol of the spotless innocence and perfect purity with which the priest should appear at the altar, that he may be accounted worthy to partake with the blessed who are clothed in snow-white garments in the never-ending joy and felicity of the heavenly nuptial feast. For they only who have washed their robes in the white blood of the Lamb stand before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. He that shall overcome shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. That's the apocalypse. Holy Scripture itself looks upon the white linen as emblematic of sanctity, for of the transfigured spouse of Christ, the glorious church who is called the eternal nuptials of the Lamb, and it is granted to her that she should clothe herself with fine linen glittering and white. For the fine linen are the justifications of the saints. And if you remember at the Transfiguration, what, do, what does uh, Peter, James, and John see? Oh, you know, brilliant white as snow. There it is. So when you see this, you already, not Brendan, but you are seeing... <laughs> the prefigurement of the new and eternal Jerusalem. Therefore, the priest should, through exercises of piety and works of charity, by self-denial and a penitential spirit, by watchfulness and humility to persevere and advance in the grace of God, to make progress in virtue and holiness and purity, and more and more a refrain not only from sin, but also from worldly, faulty, and dangerous inclinations and attachments. Next is the cincture or the girdle. It is necessary to gather up the long alve that it may be fitted closely to the body. The cincture should be tied around the loins, for by this act is expressed its higher and symbolic meaning which is evident from the prayer, gird, gird me, O Lord, with the signature of purity and extinguish in my heart the fires of concupiscence, that the virtues of chastity and countenance abiding always in me, I may serve thee better. So even the signature I wear, I've said this every day, every time I put this on since 1968. <laughs> so it is a safeguard to gird oneself or loins is a figurative expression often repeated in Holy Scripture. And the saying has a manifold sanctification, signification. Laborers, warriors, pilgrims girded themselves in order to gather up their loose white garments and to hold them securely. They were then freer in their movements, more at ease, and consequently better prepared for labor, battle, or travel. Now the Christian life is justly represented as a time of labor, of combat, of pilgrimage. The life of man upon earth is a warfare, and his days are like the days of a hireling. As a servant longs for the shade and is and the hireling for the end of his work, the Christian is a laborer in the vineyard of the Lord, where he must bear the heat and the burden of the day in order to gain an eternal reward. 
He also must be a good soldier of Jesus Christ, please him to whom he has engaged himself and must strive for mastery, that he may be victorious over Satan, the world, and the flesh. Finally, he is also upon the earth as a stranger and pilgrim, having here no permanent abode, but traveling onward to his true eternal home in the next world. A frivolous, distracted, and worldly mind is as great an encumbrance to the Christian laborer, combatant, and pilgrim, as would be to the earthly, loose, wide garment, by the girdle, the, the cincture, that is, he girds his loins so as to maintain purity of heart. The loins are considered as the principal seat of sexual desires. The girding of them symbolizes especially the subjugation of the flesh by mortification and self-denial. For precisely in the crucifixion of the rebellious flesh, in the bridling of the sensual appetites, the spiritual vigor of manliness of the Christian labor, the combat and the pilgrim are proved to be most striking matter. As a stranger and pilgrim, whose true home is with his Father in heaven, the Christian must lead a heavenly life on earth. He must not be immersed in the base things of earthly life, nor be taken up with worldly gratification and enjoyments, but he must, with all his energy, resist the seductive allurements of earthly desires and passions in order to preserve the robe of innocence, the alb, undefiled. The fervent Christian unceasingly mortifies his sensual inclinations, ever walks on with loins girded and his lamb burning, sober and watchful, in dread of the reckoning to come, and in the expectation of the blessed hope at the coming of the Lord at the end of time. So the cincture then is uh, another manifestation. So when you see these things at the altar, you really have to be praying for the priest for his sanctification at the altar so that what he does at the altar, you're going to reap the benefits. So uh, I, had a, I had a black signature, but you don't need to see that. So anyway, the sacred vestments that we see rare, uh, uh, regularly are the chasuble, the cope, the stole, the maniple, the almatic, the tunic and the humeral veil. Each one of these vestments uh, is a visual uh, aspect of what the spiritual, the mystical uh, meaning of these at the altar should be instructing us. So, you know, it's not, oh, hey, Father looks nice. These are pretty vestments. No, these are liturgical vestments which teach us of the sanctity of what is going on at the altar. The... Um, Where's the next verse? Where is it? Here. The maniple. Yes. This is, this is the actual length of the maniple that, would be, that should be used. I remember I was at uh, one of the churches in St. Louis, and I saw a little piece of material like this. What is it? Well, that's the maniple. That's liturgical minimalism. <laughs> What is the maniple? Uh, it's taken from the liturgical text. The bishop presents the maniple to the newly ordained subdeacon with the words, receive the maniple by which are signified the fruits of good works in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And then when it's put on at mass, may I be worthy to bear the maniple of weeping and sorrow with the exaltation I may receive the reward of labor. Now, Manipulus, <laughs> it's funny, it means a bundle. So this was a common garment which people used as a uh, sweatband. So I would say we should make liturgical sweatbands <laughs> because uh, you can see how long this is. I mean, when I showed this to Father Robin, he could use it as a stole. <laughs> So it's a linen cloth, usually actually used for wiping the hands after meals, napkin placed uh, before the table, a small little apron, little cloth. The names express the original form and use of the maniple. 
And the beginning was not an ornament for wear, but for cleansing the face and the hands. And you might want to recall the sudarium covering the face of Jesus. That could be what this was. According to the liturgists in the Middle Ages, the maniple symbolizes the penance and the sweat of the present life, represented by the left side, namely the left arm. Remember when you were growing up, left people were bad, <laughs> and the nuns tried to change from left to right? Didn't work with me. <laughs> the real and natural reason for wearing the maniple is in order that the right arm and the right hand may remain free and undisturbed in the performance of their functions. So in other words, like blessing people, giving out communion, all those little things. The symbolic meaning of the maniple here alluded to is probably based on the circumstance that originally it served the celebrant to wipe off perspiration and tears during the celebration of the Mass but sprang principally from the passage in the Psalms in which the word manipulus is mentioned in the sense of a sheaf of wheat. Remember, those that sow in tears shall reap in joy. There's the maniple. So the maniple symbolizes on the one hand penitential tears and grief, the toil and hardships of sowing, the suffering and the combating, the work and labors of this perishable life. But on the other hand, it represents the fruit of good works and the sheaves full of merit, as well as the abundant harvest of happiness and joy, of peace and rest reaped in eternity. The cries of sorrow and sowing will give place to the sounds of harvest songs of joy. He that sow in blessings shall also reap in blessings. The priest, therefore, sows the good seed daily, the Mass, Scatter abroad the seed of good works, works of love, of penance, of piety, of spiritual and corporal works of mercy. Sows the seed amid sweat and tears, in storm and showers, in rain and cold. For behold, the day will soon come when the ears will be ripe and the sheaves be full and garnered into the granaries of the Heavenly Father. The day that no one knows, no evening, the day of the most gladsome, blessed harvest, jubilation, unspeakably bright day of eternity that shines in the saints. Thus, the maniple is a symbolic expression of the exalted truth. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Since the maniple denotes weeping and sorrow, it is used in the Holy Mass, where the sacrifice of the cross is renewed and where the sufferings and the cruel and bitter death of Jesus are represented. As a rule, it is not worn outside of the Mass because no sorrow can compare with the sorrow with which Christ endured on the cross, a sorrow which should, be, which should penetrate our hearts during the Holy Mass. Here we have then the stole. In Holy Scripture in ancient times, the stole signified in general every kind of dress, every outfit, every adornment of the body. Since the ninth century, the stole has gradually restricted to the article of liturgical vestment. Originally, it was called an orarium. Can we look at the next slide? What's the next slide? Uh, hold on, you gotta, you, I, this is, I have to explain this all to you. This, this is complicated. <laughs> The orarium was originally a small band, a long linen strip, which was loosely suspended from the left shoulder. It was distinctive badge of the deacon who served at the holy table and was used to wipe the mouth and face. If they tried that here, they'd be in trouble. <laughs> Already in the seventh century, the orarium, worn by deacons, priests, and bishops, but in different ways, had only symbolical character. Hence, it began to be made of precious material and to be richly adorned. At the present time, the stole is a long strip as wide as the hand, adorned at the end with, in the middle with a cross. The stole should be worn only by those who are strictly members of the hierarchy, that is, deacons, priests, bishops. It is principally intended to be worn when the graces and blessings are dispensed, 
Therefore, it is used at Mass as well as all other functions which pertain to the Eucharist, the source of every grace and blessing, in administering the sacraments and performing the sacramentals. And so, like Father Brendan has, uh, the, uh, the stole is crossed. So these are the prayers which the bishop says and which are used at Mass. First of all, a subdeacon receives just a tunic. It's a longer, looks like a dalmatic. It's a longer, though. Uh, May the Lord clothe thee with the tunic of gladness and the garment of joy. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then the subdeacon receives the book of epistles. The deacon receive the spotless stole from the hand of God. Fulfill thy ministry, for God is peaceful to increase his grace unto thee, who lives and reigns forever and ever. And then the bishop puts the dalmatic over that stole. May the Lord clothe thee with the garment of salvation and the vesture of gladness, and may the dalmatic of justice every encompass thee in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so then when the priest receives the stole, the bishop will put it on like this, Receive the yoke of the Lord, for his yoke is sweet and his burden is light. And at Mass, when the stole is put on, uh, Father kisses the cross and then uh, places the stole. Restore to me, O Lord, the stole of immortality, which I lost by the transgressions of the first parent. And although unworthy, as I draw near to thy sacred mystery, may I be found worthy of everlasting joy. The stole is placed around the back of the neck. It symbolizes the yoke and the burden of the service of the sanctuary. It was also a garment of honor, of distinction. But the stole also represents it as a robe of innocence required for the worthy administration of the spiritual office and as well as that garment of glory with which the good and faithful servant will be clothed by the Lord as eternal reward. So the stole is a symbol of the arduous, but at the same time blessed and honorable ministry exercised in the sanctuary of the Lord. This service of the Lord, this busy life spent in the care of the souls, is a yoke and a burden. What are they? The faithful performance of pastoral office, the preaching of the word of God, the celebration and dispensation of the mysteries of salvation, the preservation of discipline and good morals in congregations, the training and direction of the faithful, especially of the youth in the way of salvation, the care of the poor and the sick, the preventing or suppression of scandals and dangers from the flock entrusted to one's care, costs much labor and hardship, many sufferings and combats, with many exertions and sacrifices. The yoke that is the office of the bishop and of priest is heavier than that of the deacon, therefore they wear the stole on both shoulders. But the priestly vocation with all its labors and responsibilities attaching to the life of a priest is lightened and sweetened by the mighty grace of the Lord, whom the Lord chooses as his servant, him he helps to carry the burden. The last vestment, these have not changed over the centuries. The last vestment is the chasuble, the little chasuble. Father Brent, if you want to take the one with the red stripes, that one. This is what was called a full bell chasuble. And uh, this came from Monsignor Hellrig, whom I worked with for nine years in St. Louis. And this was made from one of the parishioners' wedding dresses. Now, what do you notice? Oh, see, it's even too much to get on. Here, why don't you, you have to slip under here. You have to. Now you see why 
he needs help with incensing the altar. <laughs> the, what are called the aura freeze, the bandings. It is a representation of what the office holds. The front part, always the symbol of Christ crucified. The back part, the symbol of uh, restitution or forgiveness of the faithful. The two parts of the vestment, love of God and love of neighbor. I'm gonna put this down for a second because at the ordination of the priest, um, most of the time uh, they would use what is called, not, the, uh, not this vestment, but I would call it the Baroque vestment. So as the one to be ordained would come to the bishop, he would place this over the ordinance head, receive the priestly garment by which love is understood, for God is powerful to increase in you charity and a perfect work. But if you notice the back, it's folded. Had any of you ever seen this before? Ah, good. <laughs> It was unfolded after the ablutions at Mass. And what it then signified was the priest that had the authority to forgive sin. So, love of God, love of neighbor in divine mercy. Isn't that great? Yeah. Believe it or not, these are they look like chasubles, but they are actually copes. Remember I told you about the cope? So in uh, being practical, they had the cope as a has half or like a circle. And then it covers the shoulders. This is used for like the Benedict. There's no, there's no claps, it fell off. Okay, so let me, here. I told you this was going to be a show and tell. <laughs> All right, so this is a cope. You see, it covers everything. Now, say, for instance, I need a chasuble. All I do is put these pieces together. And guess what I have? I have a chasuble. Two for the price of one. We don't see many of these anymore because copes are very seldom used. So anyway, the chasuble, this could, I think you, Brenda. The chasuble is the last vestment, but is the one that's been altered the most throughout history. This, up until like I said 1900s, was still supposed to be used at masses. What took place is we have what's called the Baroque chasuble. What, what is the next slide? These are the, some of the tombs in the Vatican. So here we have, actually he's vested in pontifical vestments, but if you really strain, he's wearing a Baroque chasuble. What's the next one? This is a rubbing from a medieval uh, tomb, mitre. You can see the fancy amice around his neck, the full chasuble, like the pallium stole, then the stole underneath, the maniple. You see the two little vestments there? The longer one, the tunic, the shorter one, the delmatic. And look how long the alb is. And it has the little images of the, uh, the, uh, the apparels on it. So this was common, and he's got the pontifical gloves, like this. Those haven't changed much either. What is our next slide? This is in the Vatican, and you can see it's a full chasuble, 
all the vestments under, uh, properly dressed in death and using all the vestments that are prescribed from the Council of Trent. Now, let me have Father Brendan hold up the black chasuble. This vestment was uh, designed by Monsignor Hellriegel, and actually black is the color. Turn it for the back, turn it to back. Now here, every follower of Christ must pick up the cross daily and follow him. But what is the cross? It is the tree of life. Black is naturally the color of mourning, but as Monsignor always told me, the black vestment should be lined in red, showing the living martyrdom of the deceased. So you have sorrow and you have martyrdom all in one. Now when you get the violet one. This was done by St. Martha's Guild. Where's Julie? There she is, over here. This was uh, a vestment. It also says like investments that if they get too tattered, they should be thrown out, they should be burned. I didn't pay attention. <laughs> Just show the back. All right, so this was the velvet. This, these, these designs are again from Monsignor. And the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. So for the season of Advent, and the custom was to put precious or pieces of glass, actually, or plastic, on the vestments uh, to add to the beauty and the, the dignity of these vestments. So again, this is not a full chasuble, but this comes down almost to the wrists of the celebrant. So this is modified from this white one quite a bit. But you see how much is cut away. All right, now I'm going to show you, uh, I will show you this one here, this. this one here. This is another bell chasuble, and this was a design that Monsignor uh, recovered from a, um, a tomb. It was the Bishop of Hildesheim from the Middle Ages, and this was a Full bell chasuble, raw silk, so it's natural, and then just the uh, bandings around here to almost give the impression of a pallium. This <laughs> was used for the first vernacular mass in the United States in 1964 at Keele Auditorium in St. Louis. And then there's the little gold one. This. I think that. Just show the back. Now this you have to you have to uh, be uh, uh, kind of a detective. This is woven, and you could call it cloth of gold, but not technically. But it's all woven. But if you examine, this is for Easter. If you examine very, very carefully, hold the, bo hold the bottom. Sure thing. No, I have to hold it like this. Here, Dorothy, grab that end. Right, he right here in the middle at the very bottom is actually a phrase, resurrexit tertia die. If you didn't study this, you would never know that this is even on this vestment. Can you see the letters? Yes. So you can look at it later. Finally, there's a last Roman ch or Baroque chasuble, uh, which is cut down as much as possible. And this is probably from the 1700s, I think. And this is all hand embroidered with angels and flowers and things of this nature. So, I mean, while very beautiful, now why did this all take place? 
I can tell you from personal experience, the older you get, this gets very heavy. So you cut more and more away, and this is what you have. And this is probably most popular uh, today among the younger clergy. And I'm going to go through some slides and tell you more stories. What is our next slide? Again, the full chasuble, I believe it's, uh, the painting is called the, the Communion of Saint Jerome. So you can see uh, the priest, full chasuble, and how much material there is. Next slide. This is the Pope. <laughs> full papal vestments, the tiara, the pallium, the, the amos, the chasuble, the tunic, the dalmatic. And you say, why don't they pay attention? <laughs> you know, and then what happens? All people make their own vestments. Businesses make their own vestments. And they don't follow any liturgical norms. And when that happens, this is what you get. I don't know who that is. <laughs> but I think it was for a children's mass. I think it was Photoshop. <laughs> so our next slide. This week is St. Nicholas Day. St. Nicholas, a bishop, martyr, etc. Here he is with his uh, mitre, his crozier, somewhat full chasuble, the orarium, apparel amos, and the surplus, which is a shortened version of the alb. So that's a nice photo or picture of St. Nicholas. And then the next one is for the eastern rite. So he's got the, the bishop's vestment, the stole on the outside, the holy book, the pectoral cross, the crown. This is the most common image of uh, St. Nicholas. But then, again, because of liturgical aberrations, this is what should not happen. <laughs> I have to explain all this to you. First of all, he's not wearing an alb or an amos. <laughs> Instead of the cincture, he's wearing a black belt. Wrong. The pontifical gloves have no insignia. The pontifical buskins or boots, wrong color. The mitre yeah. doesn't follow any historical <laughs> precedent. And his whole vesture, I could not find this anywhere in any history book on the vestment of St. Nicholas. So I want to thank you for your patience. I hope you learned something. <laughs> but remember, when you see all these things at the altar, uh, Look at them very carefully because they all point to the mystical theology of what is taking place at the Mass. And, you know, what is active participation? Well, it's, it's part of this is knowing what all these things mean. Because then if you know them and you see them, you don't, you don't see them clearly from your place in the church, but you know that this is what each priest is vested and this is how and what he's doing at the altar, and what it should represent. So uh, thanks for listening, and have a blessed Nicholas Day. <laughs> I forgot the most important thing. We all think that traditional vestments are not available anymore today. They are. Last year, I had commissioned this vestment to Our Lady of Guadalupe. We wore it for the first time last uh, December 12th. We wore it again this December 12th. But this is done by Alterworthy? Alterworthy. And all hand done. And you can come take a look at it. The, uh, it's, it's, it's the litany. It's the roses. It's the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And uh, it is worthy to be at the altar. So don't think that these things are not possible. And this is why artist skills are important. You have to support 
good art. You have to, this is costly. This is very costly. But can you imagine the beauty at the altar of God on the Feast of Our Lady for and using something like this? I mean, it's, um, it's wonderful. So if you have the means, if you know artists, you have to encourage them to perfect their art. So I'll, I'll give it back to Father Joshua. I'm done.